distinguished Congressman uh, G.K. Butterfield from North Carolina, the great state of North Carolina, here with us. We can give it up. We'll be giving it up throughout the morning for him. <clears throat> um, and I'll tell you more about him uh, shortly because he's beyond being a distinguished leader representing our interests. He has just been an awesome, awesome partner for the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. And um, you are at his conference as well because he is our honorary co-chair. Uh, this year, so we hope you're enjoying your time, but also really learning. And we're really happy to hold this particular panel because Google is one of our longtime partners and sponsors. Uh, many of you know us for ALC, but we actually have uh, Leadership Institute paid internships and opportunities for young people, um, and that is in part possible because of Google and partners like Chanel and Madison um, and and uh, uh, all of our Google, um, you know, f sponsored fellows that have gone on to do great things. So. So please take advantage of, um, of all the, the sessions that are here today. And in particular, because it's Friday morning, we appreciate you for waking up early to be here. Send your texts, use your social media, get folks to come here. We're in room 202B. Um, but we are happy you're here so we can have a very important conversation today about investing in early stage businesses. So um, without further ado, um, I want to introduce you to uh, the Honorable uh, Congressman G.K. Butterfield. He is a lifelong resident of Eastern North Carolina. He sits on the Energy and Commerce um, and House Administration Committee. He has done amazing work and, and has worked with us since he started the uh, Diversity Task Force with the CBC looking at diversity in uh, the tech sector. He's also been very active um, overall in, in really providing and encouraging STEM education for young people. And so uh, beyond that, I just want to thank you on behalf of David Hinson and the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. I worked under uh, in cooperation with him and his team while, when he was CBC chair as well. And he has really been at the forefront of, of pushing and supporting the work you're going to see from our very distinguished panelists who I'm looking forward to learning from myself because in another life I was one of you. I was trying to be like you. And so I want to learn how this works, especially from the business side. And so having leaders like you in the entrepreneurial entrepreneurship space is great. So again, um, we welcome Congressman G.K. Butterfield. Without further ado, let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, again. thank you and good morning. Good morning. Let me thank you very much for coming out this morning to share in this very, very important conversation. A special thank you to Google for all the work that you're doing. Uh, I know some of it, and the part that I know indicates to me that you are definitely a company uh, that is inclusive and a company that is on the rise. If you think Google cannot rise anymore, I believe they have some other innovations that are on the table, and, and I think the best is yet to come. So thank you, Google, for, for all that, that you, you do. Let me just bring greetings to you from the 55 members of the Congressional Black Caucus. We are the largest caucus now in the history of the Congress. Uh, Forty-three of us serve in the House of Representatives, and 53 of us serve in the House of Representatives, and of course two in the United States Senate, uh, both of whom are running for President of the United States. Uh, but uh, bring greetings from, from all 55 of us. Uh, I do serve on the Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, there are several what we call exclusive committees in the Congress, the Ways and Means Committee, the, the Appropriations Committee. Uh, the other exclusive is Energy and Commerce. It's exclusive because we have jurisdiction over many, many issues that are very important to the American people. Yes, we have jurisdiction over energy and renewable energy and the environment and hazardous waste and health care and Medicare and telecommunications and the internet and privacy and, and all of the other things that you can imagine. And so it's a very important committee and, and I've been on the committee now for 12 years and I have tried to give particular attention to the technology sector. Uh, the media sector as we try to analyze the diversity challenges that we face and try to find ways and means to, to solve the problem. When I became chair of the Congressional Black Caucus some years ago, um, I, my initiative, my vision uh, was to analyze the Fortune 500 companies and to determine uh, wh what type of diversity score those companies should receive. Hmm. Uh, when I looked at those 500 companies with gross revenues in excess of, of $12 trillion, 
it was too massive for us to undertake. We didn't have the bandwidth uh, to deal with, with that type of data. And so we decided to filter down and to look at technology companies. And as we looked at technology company, companies, there are a lot of companies that are classified as tech companies. Uh, Walt Disney, for example, I spoke to them earlier this morning. It's a technology company. We don't think of Walt Disney as technology, but, but it is. And so uh, we decided to filter even more. And so we decided to look at the top 20 uh, technology companies in the country. And of course, Google was one of those, and Apple, and Facebook, and all of the other companies that you hear about every day. And when we looked at the data, we were absolutely appalled. We were disappointed uh, that these companies are not uh, demonstrating uh, uh, diversity and inclusion at the level that we thought they should. Mm -hmm. And so we rolled up our sleeves and created this thing called CBC Tech 2020. Uh, and we started to engage with these companies. Uh, I came out of the civil rights movement, and so I know that there are two ways to, to deal with a, 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 a civil rights problem. One is direct action where you just go out and hit them in the head. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and that was a philosophy during the civil rights days, and some of you have read about that. But the other option was negotiation, mm -hmm. demand and negotiation. And so we in the Congressional Black Caucus uh, debated whether or not we would just you know, go big and go hard or whether we would try to, to reason with, with our friends in, in Silicon Valley. And so we chose the latter, reached out to to uh, the Big 20 and went out to Silicon two or three, maybe four times and met with top CEOs of, of these companies. And most of them got it. Most of them got it. Uh, they, we told them that unless the CEO personally buys into to the notion of diversity and inclusion within her company or his company, it ain't going to happen. It has to have the buy-in of the CEO. And so we met with these companies and all of them pledged uh, at varying degrees, uh, to work with us in, 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 in this space. And I will say that Google was right at the top. Uh, Google stepped up immediately and recognized uh, the, the problem that we had identified and agreed to work with us to, to, to in, increase the numbers. And so Google is moving in the right direction, not fast enough. Uh, but moving in the right direction, and it's because of some of the people that you see in this room uh, that, uh, that, that that is happening. When we talk about diversity and inclusion, we, we, we are talking about top to bottom, We're talking about the board of directors, you know, the men and women uh, who serve on, on the corporate board, uh, because corporate boards really matter. They set policy and the tone uh, for the company. They work with the CEO and the COO and the uh, and, and the C-suites, the, the board is, is where it starts. It's not where it ends, uh, but where it starts. And so we, we, wanted, we, we want a seat at the table uh, mm. in boardrooms across America, and we are beginning to see that. But just having a seat at the table is not going to get us where we need to go, but that is where you begin. And then you look at the C-suites, and different companies define their C-suites in different ways, uh, but C-suites are very important because these are the top execs uh, within the companies that really make the decisions. Uh, we, uh, back on the board for just a moment, uh, there's a term in corporate America called board ready. Uh, as we make the demand for more African Americans and, and other minorities on, on boards, we, we, we get feedback from companies that the, the candidate for the, the position must be board ready. And so I want to challenge us to think about that and to redefine what board ready means. Hmm. Uh, board ready doesn't mean somebody who already serves on two or three other boards. Uh, that's not what it's all about. We mean talented, uh, accomplished individuals who can think, who can analyze, and who, can, who understands a corporate mission. And, and I was taught in law school years ago, the corporate mission is about the bottom line. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not a nonprofit organization. You know, corporate America is for profit. And, and I acknowledge that. And we have very capable uh, people in this country who can serve on boards. But after you talk about the boards and the C-suites, then you have to look at the workforce. Uh, we want our companies to, to voluntarily provide data uh, so that we can analyze the metrics to see where we, we are uh, in terms of African-American representation in the workforce. Uh, and some companies is hovering around 2 and 3%. Mm -hmm. uh, Google is a little higher. Uh, some companies are a little lower. But we really want to get into the double digits in terms of, of, of the workforce. And then you're talking about the entry-level folk and, and, and young people who are being recruited from college campuses uh, to come to our technology companies. 
we're going to need one and a half million new tech workers over the next five years. And if we continue to graduate students at the rate we are today, we will only accomplish one million of those 1.5. Hmm. So I want you to encourage your friends and family back at home to, to get involved in, in technology, and, and not just in high school, but in the middle grades. And some of the panelists may say even in elementary school, get those young people involved in technology because these are the jobs of the 21st century. So I want to thank you for coming today. I'm looking forward to a very robust conversation. And um, let's come back next year and let's measure what we've done over the last 12 months. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Congressman, for your remarks. Um, I'm super excited to be here on behalf of Google, representing Google for Startups. My name is Madison Jacobs. Um, and the beauty of this panel, um, I think me and Damola were eating breakfast earlier today, and he's like, I'm so excited to be the only man on this panel. So I just, I just <laughs> wanted to acknowledge that. Um, but um, <laughs> at Google, um, and at Google for Startups, we really, our mission in the world is to level the playing field for startup founders across the globe. Um, and that means that we put a lot of emphasis and energy into making sure that we provide the best of Google, access to resources, connections, and best practices to everyone that wants to become a founder or an entrepreneur. And that includes people of color, that includes women, that includes so many other different types of people that should have access to the things that they didn't have access to before. Um, so that's really the largest charter of the team that I represent at Google. Google, we do that for three reasons. One of the reasons is that Google was a startup once upon a time, so it's core to our mission to help startups succeed and to help them um, build in the future, and they're doing that off the back of Google products. Many of the panelists um, use Google products in their current ventures today, and um, it is good not only to their businesses that we build products that are inclusive to their teams and can help their businesses grow, but it's great for Google as the ecosystem uses Google products to build a world that's more accessible for all. And then third, um, supporting startups and supporting Supporting founders of color is just absolutely the 100% right thing to do, mm -hmm. but it's just the 100% correct thing to do, right? We're in the business of helping people succeed, not because it's a handout, but because we care very much about their success, and we know that having these businesses and having these folks in the ecosystem is what help makes our, our world a better place. So thank you so much for being here today. On behalf of Google, we're super excited. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what we do also at Google for startups in terms of how we empower and represent under, uh, underrepresented founders. Um, one of the things that we do um, is a program that we run in Durham, North Carolina. I'm actually headed there next week. Um, it's called Black Founders Exchange, and it's a one le week long immersion program where founders come and get the best of Google um, and access to resources that they've never had access to before. So um, it's really a really amazing moment in time, um, and Damola was a part of that program and can speak to that as well. Um, we also have, we're a global team at Google for Startups, so we have six campuses across the entire globe where startups come and build their companies with us, and a lot of our founders from the United States also go and spend time at those global campuses and do things there, so um, it's really awesome to see the sort of ecosystem effect that we build and are able to create um, across our global startup communities for our founders in the U.S. and for our black founders. Um, and so today's discussion I'm super excited for. I'm going to have each of the panelists introduce themselves. Um, but thank you so much for joining us, and I cannot wait to, to get into it. So we'll start with Felicia. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much to uh, CBC and the entire foundation and team and Google for having us and putting this panel together. My name is Felicia Hatcher. I am the co-founder of Black Tech Week, along with my really cute husband over there who's working with us today, uh, as well as uh, Space Call Tribe, which is a co-working space and urban innovation lab based in the uh, historic Overtown area of Miami. And so we started Code Fever, which is our nonprofit, six years ago to address a really important need that is quite frankly a global need, right? Like Miami's startup ecosystem was just starting to spread up, and it was not inclusive of the black community at all. So, um, not with youth programming, not with startup activity, not with resources, and that was very problematic for us um, as entrepreneurs at the time. And it was kind of like that moment where we had to figure out like what we were what were we going to do in order to fix this problem because we we know that genius exists in our community and it was disconnected from the resources. So over the right. past six years, uh, we have been on a mission to essentially rid black communities of innovation deserts. And so, what does that mean? If you're familiar with food deserts. The same thing has been happening from an innovation standpoint 
as it relates to our community, literally for centuries, but as we're talking about within the innovation economy, things need to move much faster. The resources exist in cities, but it's completely skipping over black communities. Mm -hmm. And so we set out to solve that problem, one, initially with providing computer programming training, uh, digital literacy, and then like how to navigate a startup ecosystem as a person of color. Uh, we built the first like black tech ecosystem in the state of Florida when no one thought it was important to do so. Hmm. Uh, from there, it really started to focus more on ecosystem building because we realized that we didn't want to be another educational nonprofit that was in the train and pray. So you're training and then you're praying that there's a job, right. an internship, right. and a mentorship, a job shadowing opportunity for the young people that we were training. And we've personally trained hands on over 4,000 students in South Florida in digital computer programming, uh, uh, digital literacy, and then navigating a startup ecosystem as a, as a person of color. Uh, we have built platforms that have actually introduced over 2.5 million students and teachers across the United States in a partnership with NBC Universal um, with a platform that we built for Hour of Code with the Grinch video game with our students and with black developers. And so, um, but moving from an educational program to ecosystem building because we realized that we wanted to ensure that opportunities actually were in Miami um, for our young people and that's where we created Black Tech Week. And Black Tech Week is a week-long series of events that take place in, in Miami and now in seven other cities across the United States to introduce our young people to what the possibilities are. Um, one, to also shine a light on the opportunities that exist locally within our black neighborhoods. And then most importantly, then to bring like literally all the resources. So the heads of accelerators, um, you know, we've had hundreds of some of the most impressive, like top talented uh, tech entrepreneurs and CEOs and innovators and, education, and educators grace our stage at Black Tech Week. Um, but most importantly, it, with talking about kind of early stage investment, we also wanted to bring dollars to our entrepreneurs and shine a light on African American and Caribbean entrepreneurs that existed in Miami. And a lot of that kind of stemmed from asking ourselves, like, what happens when your friends and family are the only ones that can give you around? Oh, I'm sorry. What happens when... Um, when they can't, <laughs> it's the opposite. We got you. It's, it's too early for me. Um, <laughs> you know, what happens when you can only get a, a round of applause instead of, like, a round of funding, right? And that's a real issue that exists in, in our communities. Like, right. our, our entrepreneurs that are in our spaces are building really fantastic companies, but they don't have a friends and family round. And then most importantly, like the communities that they exist in don't have the proper infrastructure right. to even keep them there or support them. And so that's where Black Tech Week came into place, um, helping entrepreneurs raise money, also raise their social capital to get the eyeballs of people that also have money and opportunities for them. And then um, with our VC and residence program, and then last but not least, Two years ago, we opened up a co-working and urban innovation lab. Uh, we were only one of th three that existed in the entire state of Florida that existed in a black neighborhood when we started um, that co-working and urban innovation lab. And since then, I think another six have sprouted up, um, which is really impressive. But when you think about how important it is to have a magnetic resource and space, that can kind of corral all of that innovation activity into black neighborhoods is extremely, extremely important. And so that's us, that's what we've started. Um, we've seen some major success stories, but then I think also as an, an ecosystem builder, mm -hmm. it's also been extremely challenging to kind of chase down opportunities mm -hmm. to then be able to make sure that people are respecting our communities and valuing the way that the black community has always add value within to the inno innovation economy. Very good. Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning. My name is uh, Damolo Binipe. I'm one of the co-founders and the CEO of Civic Eagle. Uh, we use artificial intelligence to help organizations manage government policies, so government legislation and regulations. We use AI to find bills across the country that may impact an organization, and we do some lightweight analysis on it and allow them to kind of manage all of the work that they do around advocacy and lobbying work. So some of our customers include Comcast, uh, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, local nonprofits, um, think tanks like the Bipartisan Policy Center. Um, so really working to not only help organizations that have the money to um, kind of manage all of the lobbying and advocacy work that they do around research and analysis on, on legislation and regulations, but also um, for nonprofits that don't have that money that can utilize 
um, technology like artificial intelligence. Um, it's funny, Madison brought up a little bit more about, about our company, but Madison brought up the Black Founders Exchange, which Google uh, funds and, and, and helps run. And uh, at the Black Founders Exchange, uh, about a year and a half ago now, um, we pitched there, and a woman named Arlen Hamilton, who runs Backstage Capital, mm -hmm. uh, decided to invest the very first check in the Civic Eagle, uh, $25,000. And, and um, that was the, the first investor to essentially say that through, through not just words, but through a check, uh, that they believe in, that, you know, in what we're doing. And since then, it's been a year and a half now, and since then, uh, we went on to raise over $2 million. Um, so her, her check was, was uh, the seed, you know, money that, that we needed um, and very, I mean, relative to what we've raised now, a very small amount, um, but probably way the heaviest, way the most. Um, and I think that just goes to show like how important that kind of early stage support is to giving entrepreneurs like myself uh, the ability to, to know that people believe in us, um, give us some runway, some room to, to innovate and to grow and do things that we're able to do now. And, and for us, it's just the beginning. Um, some personal information about myself, uh, you know, policy is, is very personal to me. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up as an undocumented immigrant, so immigrated from Nigeria. So for 10 years, between 6 and 16, I was undocumented and spent a lot of time in, in you know, the immigration court system and fighting for, for permanent residency and eventually citizenship. And the, the, the world and our, our country as it is right now is, is very different than what it was for, you know, me. Uh, you know, this is at this point 20 years ago. Right, um, fighting for, for permanent residency with, with, my, with my parents and, and my little brother. Um, and, uh, and policy became personal to me, and that's what got me into the space that I'm in right now. Um, so it's interesting to me that you know, a lot of the rhetoric that we see from, from, from the, the divisiveness of, of national politics around immigration, um, and, and you know, I'm kind of an example, I hope, to be an example of, of what immigration looks like, um, mm. whether it's, it's you know, quote unquote legal or, or illegal, um, it's just folks that are coming here looking for, uh, you know, to make a better life, a better, uh, have a better opportunity. And, uh, and my goal is just to make sure that, you know, my parents sacrificed bringing us over here, no matter what they did to, to get us here. Um, and the fight that they took on to, you know, get me and my brother citizenship, which I got the day before my 25th birthday, five years ago now, um, that I'm making them proud and, and hopefully becoming a, uh, a good citizen and, and a good uh, showcase of, of what the immigration story actually looks like. So happy to be here and excited for, for this conversation. Good morning. My name is Ryan Richardson. Uh, I'm a diversity and inclusion advocate. I'm also the 50th anniversary Miss Black America. Woo! Thank you. Uh, and I'm also a tech executive turned founder. So my background is in the consumer technology space. Uh, early in my career, I was a marketer and spent some years at Uber running business development and marketing partnerships on the East Coast of the US before going on to serve in a couple other VP and C-suite level roles in other uh, global tech companies and startups. And uh, my experience in big tech as a woman of color was decidedly negative. Uh, and it was rooted in a sense of isolation and disempowerment uh, and in many regards hopelessness that was one part the product of uh, a culture in my organization and in the greater industry that was certainly not inclusive of me and my identity uh, but was also born out of a frustration realizing that the work that we did every day uh, failed to deliver on the promise of technology to actually be a great equalizer mm -hmm. for historically marginalized people. We talked a big game about how we support communities of color uh, and marginalized community and how our technology products and solutions really move the needle for them. But quite frankly, that was a crutch that we used when we were in challenging policy uh, positions and we needed to yield leverage over regulators. We failed to deliver on that core promise and that almost drove me out of the technology industry altogether. Uh, but rather than leaving the industry and throwing my hands up in the air, I decided uh, that it was my responsibility to start to change uh, some of the those challenges that I faced and so many other people of color in the tech industry see on a daily basis. Uh, while I was at Uber, I was one of the co-founders of what was then an employee-led diversity and inclusion task force. That was a direct response to the cultural challenges within the organization and went on to become, or was the precursor, I should say, to what uh, went on to become a now robust and well-resourced global diversity and inclusion team that is doing good work in a new Uber under new uh, direction and leadership and good work 
work within the greater industry to lead on the DNI front. Uh, and then my most recent company was an HR tech platform that I co-founded and was president of, focused on connecting uh, senior level talent of uh, historically marginalized and underrepresented communities with VP and C-suite level roles in uh, global companies. Uh, today, I am building the Ellington Lafayette Company, which is a tech incubator specifically focused on startups that have a social equity bend. So they can draw a direct line from their work, their product, their solution, their marketplace to a positive economic, social, uh, or political impact on the lives of women, people of color, or other marginalized communities in America. And I want to thank the CBCF. Uh, I want to thank Google for startups and everyone for inviting me to be a part of this discussion. I'm really looking forward to speaking more with our panelists. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. A little bit better. Good morning. Good morning. I know everybody went to the Alabama power party last night and you're <laughs> dragging in, but we're going to need all the energy. My name is Fallon Wilson and I am the CEO and co-founder of Black and Tech Nashville and I'm also the research director for Black Tech Mecca. And what these organizations do in the tech startup ecosystem is that we curate and connect a diverse black tech ecosystem in Nashville as well as nationally through data, policy, research, and community activism. The question is, Dr. Wilson, how did you get there? Glad that you asked. <laughs> I know we talk a lot about coming out of corporate and thinking about how to roll a business out of the corporate environment. I think that's a pathway into a tech startup. But I actually came out of historically black college and university. I was working at American Baptist College. Now, what is special about American Baptist College? Congressman John Lewis is a graduate of ABC. It is, was the, the, the bedstone, the bedrock of the civil rights movement in Nashville. If we think about the sit-in movement, that's where they were trained. And so I was brought on, newly minted PhD from the University of Chicago by way of Spelman graduate, and they said, Fallon, how do you re-engineer a dying historically black college? Could you really innovate for us? And so I said, can you pay me? And they was like, no, we can't. I mean, come on, HBC. They said, we can't pay you, but we'll give you a title. I said, could you make me a vice president? They was like, yes, we'll make you the vice president of development and strategic alliances. I said, well, let me work with that. And over two years of working at the college, I, I, I dove deep into understanding how higher education was changing as it related to technology. And at that point, it was the emergence of MOOCs and XEDU and Udacity, and it was just fascinating to see how higher ed was changing and how ABC, a small college in Nashville, Tennessee, could be at the cornerstone. And under the former administration, there was a moment where we could bring tech companies into HBCUs and colleges without having dealing, dealing with SACs and accreditation types of issues. And so we developed what we consider to be a cornerstone moment combining social activism with technology. Clearly Black Lives Matter was doing it. How do you credential in that? So I said, oh my goodness, we can re-engineer HBCUs and let's flip the whole model. Let's do hybrid learning. And of course, because some of our HBCUs are not, so, not ready for this moment of excitement, I had to transition. And so I left the HBCU and to find a company called Humanity EDU. University and humanity. And what we will focus on is credentialing HBCU students in this new world of human services, civic tech, gov tech. I was excited. I knew I was going to do this, right? So in Nashville, I say, well, let me go to our local entrepreneurship organization, the EC, and let's see if they can help me. I enrolled in their pre-flight program. I was incubating my ideas. I knew I was going places until I met a mentor who told me, why do you want to focus on black people? I say, what? I mean, because, you know, I'm unapologetically black. I said, why would I not focus on black people? And so every moment in the incubator process, I kept jumping into mentors or advisors or to would-be investors in the Nashville ecosystem that did not see the vision and could not understand it. And after a year of trying, I just gave up. I said, you know something, the only way that I'm going to be able to push this ideal of mine is to create an ecosystem in Nashville and then nationally that could really support the innovation of black people if black people wanted to focus on black people. And so we founded Black and Tech Nashville. But what we realized, and, and Felicia and I do a lot of work together locally and nationally, um, when I would tell the story of why you should support, support black innovators and black startups, people would look at me crazy because I would give them anecdotal stories like I just gave you. I get, kept getting pushback, um, VCs didn't get it, but I said, how about data? And so we developed a framework 
research because I have a PhD. You know, I got to put that degree to use. <laughs> My mom was like, you're a doctor. No, I'm like, I'm a researcher mother. Um, and so we looked at best practices and research in the entire ecosystem, not just the startup realm. If I only focus on the startup realm, then I would neglect K through 12 where we don't have tech instructors in our urban schools because we can't afford them, Google, because y'all pay them so greatly and they're not gonna take a $30,000 teacher's job, right? Or I have to look at corporate America and think about retention and attrition rates and why you can't retain us, right? And then I have to look at higher education, National Science Foundation, why aren't you giving community colleges the same level of funding to do broadening participation that you give to our larger private universities who don't enroll us? And so I had to look at the entire ecosystem and we looked at over 30 indicators, over 120 metrics, and now we can score cities. We've scored Chicago, we're scoring Philadelphia, we're coming to Miami, we're working on Birmingham, because we want to develop a national composite to say, if y'all are really doing and moving the needle like you say you do. Companies say they believe in diversity and inclusion, but I got, but can I see it in the data? And not just the large data sets, right? I mean, we are procuring all types of primary data around here to be able to tell a more robust story on how our ecosystems are doing in our communities so that we can have a national conversation. And so my contribution to this conversation will always be data and research based because I as a would-be and, and side hustle, one day I'm gonna re-engineer HBCUs in this new innovation moment because why can't Cornell West have an LMS? Why can't we have a learning management system with all the bright, black, brilliant professors that we know? But for now, I work <laughs> on supporting tech startup folks. So that's where I enter the conversation. Um, wow, this is like the most stacked panel of all time. So I am like super, I'm super honored to be here. Um, so I think some of you guys kind of brought this up in your narrative as you were introducing yourselves and the things that you've gone out and done in the world, particularly in the startup ecosystem. Um, and before we had this panel, we had a conversation as, as a group. So I want to open with uh, the hard hitting stuff. We, as people of color, are often asked why we support each other and one another and why we do that in our business endeavors. And one of the things that we face in terms of getting funding for our companies and scaling up um, is that the checks come as sort of a great, go out and do good in the world, and we're done here. Um, not as seen as investments that are going to grow and scale and create return for the investors that give our companies money. So I wanted to open it up to the panel, whoever wants to take the question first. What, um, why is this such a problem and, and how do we solve for it, right? So how do we, we know that there are investors that understand our ecosystem, the folks coming from like Arlen Hamilton from Backstage Capital that are giving us checks and investing in early seed because they see the vision. But um, for the people in the wider ecosystem that don't quite understand that, why do we do what we do in social impact and why does that also mean that we can be for-profit companies making money and creating revenue for our investors? What I think is lost quite often times uh, for investors who are evaluating um, social equity driven or social impact driven ventures is that fundamentally what we're doing is solving problems, right? But particularly when those ventures are led by black and brown founders or female founders, um, the automatic assumption is that they ought to be relegated to um, the realm of nonprofit work where they get a grant and we send them on their way uh, and that's all. But the greatest enterprises in American history that have uh, had the greatest impact on our economy and the business world writ large have fundamentally solved a problem. Um, I fail to understand why we discount the problems that are being solved for marginalized people, for black and brown people, especially as we consider uh, the rapid blackening and browning of the nation, um, the problems that marginalized communities face in America today are frankly just American problems and will be majority problems in the coming years. Right. So I always like to answer this question by doing a little bit of a history lesson. And Fallon has heard me tell this story multiple times. And so one, I joke with a lot of people and say, we all need to collectively come together and hire a publicist to represent the black <laughs> narrative, right? Because that is in large part the storytelling of what the possibilities are about the black community um, is, is extremely heartbreaking when we think about it, right? Mm -hmm. People 
we can all rattle off a ton of negative statistics about the black community, but if it's a rattle off five positive right. facts about the black community, people struggle. And so if we're struggling in that, how do we ever then turn around and make the business case about what the possibilities are for the black community? Right. And that is where we have to focus, right? So less on what the obstacles are, because we know what the problems are. We have socioeconomic problems, we get that. So does the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about what the opportunities are uh, to invest in the black community and the opportunity that you will miss if you do not invest in the black community. And people want to be on a winning team. And when you have that kind of conversation about what the possibilities are and what's coming out of our communities, all of a sudden it changes. We know that in sports, right? We know that like you go to Belle Glade, Florida, you go to certain parts of, of, of Miami, and you're going there because you are looking for talent. And I want us to change the conversation around what we have about black communities. So black communities are, are marketed and branded as a center for black innovation. Like you come there as a company if you are looking for the top talent because it does exist there. And so the history lesson really quick, because I don't want to hijack the panel, is <laughs> the same exact utility of, of, of Uberpool, right? Raise your hand if you've ever ridden or used Uberpool, right? A, a, ton of a few strangers piling into a vehicle to go to point A to point B, right? Paying a reduced fare. And so prior to Uber existing, 30 years ago in South Florida, we had something called um, the, the Jitney Taxi. Mm -hmm. 30 years ago, same exact utility, right? Strangers piling into a vehicle to go to point A to point B, solving a major transportation ex issue that existed in South Florida. Right. In Jamaica, it's called the Judah Taxi. Yeah. In Haiti, it's called Tap Tap. In Cuba, like I can go on a long list of how we have solved major technology, um, major transportation problems in our communities yeah. without the funding, without the Series A, Series Come B, on. and like b millions upon billions of dollars, but because it was an absolute need, right? Crowdfunding, we have Indiegogo, we have right. Kickstarter, we have all of these that have raised millions of dollars. We crowdfund every Sunday in the black church. It's called passing the plate, right? And so again, and I reference Jamaica a lot because my mom's from Jamaica, but like it's in Jamaica we call that partner. Right. Throughout the continent of Africa for generations, Susu. it's been called Susu. Ashe. So like this collective of coming together in order to fund at church, our building fund, our scholarship, <laughs> like we've done this, right? So like we have to stop with saying that we're not geniuses in our community and that the ideas haven't always existed because right. we've purely solved these ideas from a necessity standpoint and we've been innovative. Right. Where the disconnect has happened is the respectable amount of money has not gone into our ideas or our ideas get deduced to being hood, they're being ghetto, right. we laugh at them. It, Last example, right? Um, after, after slavery ended, sharecropping, some had homes, some didn't. We've been doing um, room sharing and home sharing that we now know as Airbnb, so we have to stop this right. of saying that the ideas don't exist because they do. And that's, I would, it. that's how you solve that problem. And, and I would venture to say, and I probably would be, following on what Felicia said, the gaze. What gaze I'm performing this for because I need investment dollars. I often, I'm like Stacey Abrams, like, hey, let's build and think about other forms of capital formation that does not require for me to have to conjole myself toward companies and investors who will never understand my lived experiences mm -hmm. as a black person. So building on what Felicia said, when I think about the amount of money that we raise every Sunday in our faith institutions, out of any other group of people in this country, black people give the most. Not large endowment texts, text, I mean, not the 12, 25 million, thank you Robert for doing it for Morehouse, but we give it more consistently in small sums every week. That is a notable, as we begin to think about changing the narrative. On the flip side of that, we own land, our churches, yeah own land and land is profitable. I was trying to get one foundation to say, hey, Lily, let's develop an API and scrape all of the likelihoods or do some type of modeling where we can forecast what churches are likely to sell due to gentrification. And could we get black investors across this country to buy that land and flip it and then reinvest it into tech startups? And so some of it is, I think, the gaze. 
And I'm tired of having to perform my, my wares and what I have for the white gays primarily. When I can enlarge the conversation and find other capitals of formation that we do have in our community. Between HBCs and churches and land, I think that there's a, there's a new capital formation model there. I think it's all been said. <laughs> <laughs> it's all been said. Um, so that segues into my next question for the panel. Um, these ideas that we have and that we've always had and that we've had for gener generations and generations and that we've created out of a need, not only just to serve people of color or black people, our communities, but to serve a wider problem that is happening, right? Um, and I would love to know from you guys some of the innovative technologies or innovative things that you've come across created by entrepreneurs of color recently and if you could speak to the audience about some of those things. Also being that, um, these early stage companies that are building products that are solving problems, um, they need support and they need support in so many other facets outside of just capital, right? We talk with founders all the time that talk about how important mentorship is. So this is kind of a two part question. What are some of the really fantastic companies or innovative technologies that you've seen on the rise that you'd like to speak to? And then I think I would also like to preface that with um, why things like mentorship outside of capital are important for those types of companies and founders. Yeah, I think I can start with that. Um, you know, I, I think the the larger theme, based off of your question, is you know when, as people of color, um, when we create these technologies that you know that are innovative, um, oftentimes, and this this was my experience, um, investors and other stakeholders were trying to pigeonhole you into, hey, use this technology to solve a problem for the black community, mm. right? Which then limits. Um, our market opportunity, right? So um, the very first investor I pitched, and I really wanted this guy, actually, um, he was a senior Obama official, a uh, famous guy. There's a lot of them, so I hope I'm not calling him out. But I, like, actually a very, very wealthy, famous guy. Um, and, and I was pitching him, and he said, hey, if, you, if what you're doing, if you could apply this to, let's say, like legislation that impacts black communities and then sell it to corporations because you know, these, corp these, uh, these corporations are, are really are starting to get more sensitive around um, you know, people of color and making sure that they're, you know, that they're um, engaging in best practices, um, I'll invest in you right now. So basically, focus your technology on a problem for black folks. Um, and I said, no, I was like, that's ridiculous. You're limiting our market opportunity. Like, it's one thing to say, like, hey, our technology can help solve this, this specific issue. This is a specific use case. It's another thing to say, like, this, is, this should be your sole focus because you're not capable of, 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 of creating a solution that's mass market. Um, and I think that happens a lot to a lot of my peers, folks that, that, uh, that are innovators, that are entrepreneurs, um, where, you know, if you're, if you're creating a solution that is for a specific segment of community in which a white, a white rich male um, is not tapped into, then you are their vehicle in which to extract wealth from that community, right? As opposed to, hey, I happen to be black, I'm also intelligent, also see innovation, also see global, um, you know, broad problems, and my technology can be used to address this, this more significant human-centered problem. Right or marketplace problem, um, and that's something that I see happen a lot where we try, where we you know we get pigeonholed as as, as underrepresented um, entrepreneurs and innovators. Um, to answer your your first question, you know what's the technology the technologies that I've seen? I mean, at this point, everything is predicated to be honest on automation, right? Like mm -hmm. you know we can all we can all like laugh at some some people laugh at Andrew Yang and some some of the things that he's saying you know in the presidential debates, um, and you know in universal basic income, particularly how how he's you know approaching it with. Um, with the future of automation, but it's, it's very real, right? So, I mean, most of the innovators that I know that are working on things are working on, on automating away jobs, right? They're creating technology right. that is actually right. to take jobs away, right? right? To, um, and, and to create more efficiencies for corporations when, when it comes to, um, to kind of the, the business to business uh, marketplace. So um, anything around automation, whether it's robotics, whether it's AI, whether it's NLP, uh, whether it's deep learning, neural networks, um, I'm seeing a lot of folks focus on technologies that are effectively going to remove uh, professional jobs, whether it's, you know, the legal profession, um, whether it's, you know, actually like, you know, manufacturing, it doesn't really matter to truck drivers. Um, there is technology, I promise you that um, if, if you it think serves. that your job is safe, it probably isn't. Um, right. It's probably, there's probably people like me that are creating technologies um, that will, will eventually replace you. Good luck. <laughs> that was deeply encouraging. <laughs> yeah. I have some positive news there. Um, 
I think it's interesting that you shared um, because for me, it has always been I wanted to focus on a black market and, and mentors and advisors would be like, no, that's too limiting. That's not the fully addressable market. Um, so that, that's a novel thing. Yeah, it's, different. Um, it's different. I would venture to say, at least for the research that I know of, when you talk to, if I could just anecdotally just survey all entrepreneurship accelerators or incubators that are not created by black and brown people in this country, I can look at the leadership, I can look at the mentors and say that they lack representation, right? And also their mentor pools are going to lack representation. And so some of the work that I do with the Kauffman Foundation is help them think through these questions. And when we think about the surveys and the things that they do is that if you go to any black person in a city, especially I'll use Nashville, they're like, I want to start a business. The first, first person they go to is probably the, the media and the one that's in the media that is the richest black man, it's always a black man, it's never a black woman, but I know we're rich, but they go to the black man and they say, um, Daryl of Zykron, I sold my, you sold your company for 25 million, can you help me? There's something about a relational connection to um, being able to connect with black folks in cities who have rose above, who have done it, mm -hmm. And trying to build a model around that when we think about mentoring in our community that is different than going to the accelerator that's in the white part of town where you don't have mentors and advisors that look like you. So that would be my response to that. As far as the cool technology, I love Nick Strauss. Mm -hmm. Why is that cool? Because you have a mother and daughter, a black mother and daughter, who have created this new type of social networking experience in live person, and they'll be able to take the data back and talk about how people do social groupings. Of course, they'll pull you together in groups in a room and you'll talk and you'll meet people because sometimes I'm an introvert. I don't know if you noticed. <laughs> um, and so for the introverts in the world, this app allows you at conferences and at meetings to connect with people. But on the flip side, I think they're becoming more of a behavioral analytics company to talk about how people make groups and decisions, which is really cool because I love data. Big data is a big thing. Um, and so that's really exciting. And there's another app, another social app I love that's created by this group of people out of Nashville called The Move, where they're, they're gonna try to do what, what is that um, thing on, um, what you're doing on Friday? What is, when they were trying to list out all the black events in the city, I can't think of the one, what, no well, meetup, but there was another one that tried to list the black, huh? oh, black what do black people do on Friday? Something like that, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this, this group of, of entrepreneurs, black folks have decided that I'm gonna pull all the APIs from Eventbrite, from Facebook, um, from all of these different sources of events and try to be able to tell you in each city what is the black event you should go to. Mm. How many of y'all, even in DC or in Nashville, you'd be like, there's so many things. But they've figured out how to pull the APIs, automate it, and base it on a mood. Today I'm gonna be the black socialite. What gay lamb I'm going to? Today, I'm a blurred. What scientific? Thing? They have created a, a, a tool that allows you to be able to narrow down your preference. And I think that's really cool. And it's only, they only want to focus on black people. They have told me they ain't trying to do nobody else. But, but this is what I love about at least the entrepreneurs that I'm meeting now. They, they care about creating experiences for black people. And they don't care about the rest of the market. And we need advisors and mentors who can honor that. And Google. Just put that out there. Uh, we, I've, we're seeing a lot of really exciting um, black startups in, in Miami and across the state of Florida, as well as like nationally, but I'm going to talk about Miami. Um, you know, um, Crib Shopper is a, a brother team that from Jamaica um, that are based in, in Miami, and they are completely unlocking the opportunity for people in the Caribbean to actually make purchases in the United States because there are some financial regulations that prevent that, which is opening up that entire market. They've also essentially kind of built out a delivery system within, um, in, within Caribbean uh, countries in order to be able to receive the packages that they're making, that they're purchasing, and then be able to actually get those delivered door to door um, throughout Jamaica and throughout the Bahamas, which is really, if you're, if you're familiar with what's going on there, that's extremely, extremely uh, impressive with the taxi service that exists in, in there. Um, there's another, um, a couple, they're actually here in DC this week working with Facebook, um, and the company is called The Beloved Box. And it's a husband and wife team. I love Yeah, and they, love products ours. are amazing, and right. it's a self care box, subscription box for couples. And it's just really impressive of what nice. they've been able to do and kind of enter this market of like being able to concentrate on delivering self care for couples in the, in the form of subscription box. And then, um, 
you know, we have a GovLive in, in Miami. It's a, um, uh, she's yeah, she's amazing. Um, ex Navy veteran that built a platform to better help people navigate the procurement pro- author, um, procurement process with local and state That's government. Right. And then uh, Direct Dispatch, I think, is a really impressive mm-hmm. company that um, is really timely for like this conversation because they essentially created the platform for the Uber uh, for truckers. You know, um, specifically as it relates to transportation of cars because it's an unregulated industry. Right. Mm-hmm. And once you put your car on a truck and you're relocating mm-hmm. to another, you don't know where your car is. Mm-hmm. People's cars are literally being stolen. <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> you can track, right? And then on the back end of that, it helps truckers not, because if you're, if you're a trucker going through the state of Florida, it's an eight to 10 hour drive. You don't really want to make that if you may... Once you deliver a car, right. have an mm-hmm. empty load coming Touché. out of the state. And so there's a twofold business model to that that's really impressive. Um, but he's a startup founder that is went the revenue route because he needed to, right? right. And so like he's like, it, my company makes money. He's doing six figures a year in revenue, and he's struggling to raise funding. There's startup processes in there that like I understand, like we understand, but like he can't raise the funding for this. And now Uber has... Um, and I know there's people from over here, but like they've entered, or Amazon, I think, has entered that market right. of being able to now provide like this this technology that he's been working on for the past six years. And so, I think one thing that I wanted to pull, push back on you a little bit is that when we talk about the opportunities that exist and when we're pitching solutions for the Black community, if we're talking about it only in the United States, yeah, it could be a, a, a smaller subset than being able to focus on a product um, across the nation or across the board, right, culturally. But we're, we don't ever talk about what exists globally, right? Like, we are the dominant culture, black and brown people globally. And that enter, that, that opens up what the possibilities are, that opens up what the possibilities are for returns. And that's the conversation that we have to have. And that's what technology makes possible. If you're talking about a brick and mortar, that's extremely limited. When we're talking about technology, mm-hmm. you know, what you're building with a few clicks you have now something that can be competitive across the global market. And that's how we need to be talking about the black community and the right. opportunities. And so when someone says to me, like, you're only focused on it, like, hell yeah, I'm only focused on the black community. And it represents this across the globe. Good. What you going to do? You going to write that check or no? <laughs> and, and I want to I wanna echo what you're saying. I, I agree. I think there's the, the point is, is that, you know, the, the concept of power and limitation, mm-hmm. right? Like, Understanding that if I want to build a solution for a specific community, specifically my community um, and the diaspora in general, and I, and I, I, I'm one to speak on it because specifically, like I look at at Nigeria, right, and West Africa, being from there and understanding how big we really are, like how much power we have. Um, as a technologist, saying that if that's my focus, here is my argument, here is my case, which is a good one, that there's a market for what I'm doing and that it's important, and it's meaningful. But if I, on the other hand, if, I, if I'm creating a solution and I believe it has broad market appeal and that's what I, and that's what I want to focus on, don't limit me. Mm-hmm. Don't tell me that because I'm black that I only know how to create a solve a problem for black people mm-hmm. because that's just straight up bullshit. Um, and that's what ends up happening a lot of times for black entrepreneurs and other entrepreneurs of color that, are, that have said, you know what, I'm, I'm, creating a, I'm solving a problem and the problem that I'm solving is a broad one. Right, it's, I, I, I'm making, I'm creating this B2B solution, this business-to-business solution for for this community or for this for for this uh, sector of of of, of businesses. Um, don't, you know, when I get frustrated is is people trying to limit what we want to do, what we aspire to do, um, based primarily, really, just because of, of of the color of my skin. So I think to your point, yes, like if you're building a solution um, for a community. We need to be able to one support each other, but then two, like um, you know, folks that do have the pocketbooks need to be able to come to the table and understand that uh, we have trillions of dollars in, in buying power, not just here in the United States, but if you look at the di- the diaspora across the entire world. Uh, but then also, if we're creating a solution that, if, if as entrepreneurs we're creating a solution that we believe we want to market globally to a broader market, um, that I'm still a human being and I can solve so I can solve problems for everybody, um, not just for people that that look like me. But it's unfortunate that we have to think about these things as black people, that you have to think that you have, 
that people just won't take your idea for what it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, the idea that we're having to perform ourselves to say to get investment dollars, either because you don't think I'm a, I'm focusing on a broader market, or because I do, I really want to focus on a broader market. Once again, the issue is not us; it's them. It's them. Yeah. Right. And yet again, we have to think like Stacey Abrams outside the box and think about how to get other dollars elsewhere. Because if not, we're locked into this dichotomy, this either, I, either I'm either i focusing too much on black people and you don't like it and you're not gonna invest in me and you're gonna keep me coming to these beaties and you're never gonna invest in me, but I have hope. Or are you gonna pigeonhole me because I'm a black person and I really wanna do broader work, but you think I can't do it because of explicit bias against me as a black person? And it's stressful. We gotta get outside the box. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I want to piggyback on that. Like I, my, my, one of my biggest hope for like the entrepreneurs that, that we interface is like, how do we get them like F you money? Right? Fuck you. Yes. We all know what that is, right? So like, <laughs> no. I, but can I'm we trying to keep it PC, Valen, <laughs> you know? I am so sorry. I was like, sorry. what is she going to use as a qualifier for that? <laughs> I did not. Um, and, and we know that from like a corporate um, corporate America standpoint, right? Like you always keep a little because if they act too mm-hmm, crazy, you can right. leave and you can be okay and be like, F you, I'm good, right? <laughs> um, but we don't talk about that enough from a startup and entrepreneurial perspective right. because a lot of the challenges and the BS that they face face and then ultimately the burnout that they like entrepreneurs are facing of going to people that don't look like you mm-hmm. and all the bias that already exists and then the 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 power dynamic dynamics that are on top of that when they are giving you your money and I know that like my husband and I we got VC money right like Mm -hmm. and it was a it was one of the hardest years of my life Hmm. dealing with that back and forth of someone that gave me money then felt like they essentially kind of owned us Hmm. and my husband's like primarily job became talking to our investor every single like that's how do you run a business like that and so for us, like with our entrepreneurs, like we have to get them that so that when people disrespect them and a right. lot of our entrepreneurs are facing that when they're asking for the money that they should technically and get from our communities, that they can say, you know what, I don't need your money. Instead of saying, you know what, I'm going to feel less than in this position because I desperately need this check for someone and I'm going to compromise on who I am and what I believe Hmm. in for the ultimate goal of being able to build something that's going to have an impact on my community, hire people in my community, be able to make my, like, that's what they're dealing with. Right. And so it's layered for us in our communities. Mm. And that's the difference when we're talking about black people raising money and brown people raising money uh, as opposed to white people raising money. Like we have layers of issues that we have to deal with when we're sitting across from someone that we're not addressing. And so like our 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 um, accelerator programs, our incubator programs, they have to solve for that mindset shift first. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times when we're building, like as ecosystem builders, building those programs, people don't understand that. Like how fast can they get to this? Like we got to solve for some trauma that has happened to people. Mm-hmm. On, and I Felicia. can speak from that personally because right. I, like when, when we split from our investors, I then had a daughter that was born at 1.4 pounds and I attribute that to the stress mm-hmm. of what I went, what we, we went through with our investor. Right. And then there was trauma associated with that of like trusting someone else again with my idea mm-hmm. and not, not them uh, potentially stealing my company or my poten- my company not like, going under or even just starting again like that's trauma that like entrepreneurs have trauma that we have to deal mm-hmm. with and then like the whole power structure I think is really really important so like I would love to see more of us investing in our companies I would love to see more people um, that have money that are that are in technology companies and have disposable incomes. We need to be setting up more angel networks right. locally. Right. It doesn't have to be a big check. One of our entrepreneurs, Beloved Box, got a five-figure investment from the from the lobbyist that is also a member in our co-working space that was in the office next to her. And that's transformational for her, right? Mm-hmm. right? And that's not a big check. That's not going to be on the cover of, a, of, a, of the magazine. But that was transformational for them to be able to have the luxury to then be able to innovate and keep their business going. So, like, 
you know, maybe one Sunday can be dedicated at churches That's to passing the plate for entrepreneurs. Like, let's talk tactical stuff of like, how do we do these things? Procurement opportunities right. and, um, are a huge opportunity as well. And I don't see enough of that happening from a local level of like, all right, if we can't get VC and angel money and not every company is ready for that, like procurement opportunities mm-hmm. and the right, cust- just good old customer funding and changing the way that black people do startups like we have to change that the lean startup principles does not work for black Come communities on. if you can't get friends and family money you're already not able to start the process the way everyone else is and we have to like redefine what it means to run a black startup definitely and i think it's so important to to piggyback off of what you guys said a lot of the work that's happening at larger tech companies or in in ecosystems that really care and are creating change, a lot of it is about educating founders and people of color that are going for investment that they don't need sort of this level of investment, right? They come in thinking, I need the VC capital money, but they don't understand what is attached to that and that there's so many other outlets. Um, I want to expand a little bit more on that question. You were talking a little bit about some of the opportunities that are outside of those levels of investment that people believe that they need. I would love to hear from a positive sentiment some of those routes and, in, and sort of advice on, okay, this is what an angel example looks like. This is what a you know good accelerator or incubator example looks like that's created for people like us and understands our issues and problems. I mean, Hadia just left. Um, her model, hbcu.vc, is developing a new cadre, a new cohort of potential VC investors by working through historically black colleges and universities. I say she's working through our institutions to cultivate a new crop of investors. I think, I know that's a long game down the way, Mm -hmm. but the idea that she's developing an alternative possibility for to get people like you and I, who we eventually invest in companies that are created for you and I, I think that is a, a good model to hold up. And so many black, how many HBCU students in here? Yes, love y'all. How many y'all went to HBCU? Okay, there we go. And so, and so on, on multiple levels, she is reinvigorating um, how HBC, HBCUs could begin credentialing and getting students ready for this new world of investment, also educating them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But also, these students are like, is it thirsty? No, what's the new term? Savage? Um, <laughs> grit? I'm old, y'all. I'm a zennial. Um, but they are, they're taking this curriculum that she's created, cultural curriculum, and once they finish her residency program, they're going into and working with VCs and helping them to think through their portfolios. And so that's one way we could do it. It's a long game, though. Her name is Hadia Majid, and she just left yeah, out. Just she's doing the Brain Trust HBCU session, so she just left out. Um, you know, there, I, I've, there's, a, there's a ton of resources locally. I think, you know, great um, kind of centers that, that educate people on, to your point, Madison, on like what do they really need? Everybody thinks they need VC to start. You really don't. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier, you know, our first check was 25 grand. You brought up a great point about the person that got a five-figure uh, investment, and, uh, and we were able to leverage that 25 grand into doing a bunch of things, and then eventually raised, you know, now we raised over two million, right? So, um, you know, my brother-in-law is here, and he, he's part of an organization in Minneapolis where we're headquartered um, called MEDA, right? It's a, basically an economic development force that's local. Um, and they started, like, as opposed to doing, you know, primarily small business lending, they've started to understand that there's different vehicles of investments that, pe- that startup entrepreneurs need, and they've started creating those systems, right? So I think they're a great model, and, and at this point, they're a, a national model of, of what communities can do to, to support um, startups and entrepreneurs of color. Right. Um, so I think kind of redefining what kind of local economic small business lending looks like so that if, if it works and functions for for like kind of tech startups, however you want to put it, um, is a great way because we already have some of these systems in place. We already have these institutions in place. It's just kind of rethinking the model so that it applies to the way that you know entrepreneurship works in 2019 and beyond. Um, so just kind of rethinking what those look like and then having those centers that, that you all are working on in, in your local communities um, so we can point people in, in that direction is really important. So. Um, maybe just even starting a conversation with those with those institutions. We all know where they are. We all know who they are um, locally, and just starting to work on maybe public private ways to revamp and reshape and rethink um, what lending looks like, what investment looks right. like um, in entrepreneurs uh, within institutions that already exist. 
I also very much appreciate kind of the growth or influx of these new crowdfunding platforms mm -hmm. that are specifically focused on either black businesses or social equity focused businesses. Mm -hmm. um, there is, uh, it was called We Fund Black. I think they recently changed the name to No Rich Uncle, right. um, was used by the team at <laughs> No Rich Good Uncle. Name. Uh, it's that. a great name. Uh, used by the team at We Buy Black that has built a large e-commerce marketplace of only black owned business like consumer packaged goods. Uh, and we're looking to actually open the first all black supermarket in America where every product on the mm -hmm. shelf came from a black owned business, right? Uh, and they used that crowdfunding platform in Q1 of 2019 and raised about half a million dollars from black folks in less than three months wow. to actually fund the opening of this venture in Atlanta. So platforms like that exist for us and exist for us to leverage because much to the point that most have made on this panel, um, the traditional process of raising money through VCs for black founders, particularly for black female founders mm -hmm. is um, decidedly problematic mm -hmm. uh, and leads to more of us bailing out on our entrepreneurial endeavors and just right. going back into corporate uh, enterprises than anything else. Or nonprofit work. Yeah, or nonprofit work. Yeah. Yeah, I would say um, please let's not tiptoe tip -to around the money. People need money. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not, it's just like, it's money and, right? Come on. And now. I think there's so many programs that are being funded to support black and brown entrepreneurs that don't have money attached to it. And our entrepreneurs can't fully be invested. Like, we need to be investing in our startup founders from a holistic standpoint mm. and giving them as much as possible unrestricted funding to fund their businesses. Come on. And also so that they can actually be able to show up. Childcare is a barrier. Mm -hmm. Transportation is a barrier. Student loans. Student loans are a real barrier that are, are stopping, right? And so I have not seen a program that has a fully approached from a holistic standpoint. Yeah. I think the closest thing to that that we see are pitch competitions. Right. And right. people are getting like exhausted Fatigued. by pitch competitions, right. but we don't have enough pitch competitions right. in black communities. And a lot of entrepreneurs use that pot of money, 25,000, 10,000, 5,000, whatever, and so still put money into that. I think it's extremely important. I think a lot of corporations are kind of moving away from that, and that's problematic. Um, I would say, talk, going back to procurement opportunities, like let's better Seven figure minutes. out and better right. asset map within our communities. What are procurement opportunities mm -hmm. that exist on a small level, whether it's with, whether it's with government, right. whether it's with corporations, and put our entrepreneurs directly in front of them. I think from a policy standpoint, and I can speak mostly from the state of Florida, like there are ve there's very few opportunities that exist that from a funding standpoint that I see that come into black neighborhoods that aren't tied to debt. Right. right? Mm -hmm. And if you're tied to debt, it's a really interesting game that you are kind of not allowed to play within the startup ecosystem mm -hmm. with having that much amount of debt on the table. And I see that right. on the black side and I don't see that with the white and Hispanic investor um, investors and startups on the, on the other side right. as, as it relates to, to my Miami, right? And so that is something that we need to change. Most of our startup founders, they're, they're, they don't have a tangible product. They don't have necessarily assets that they can leverage for debt opportunities. And so we have to shift that because startup game and traditional small business game is a little bit different. Yes. Um, our CRAs, our community redevelopment right. agencies, right. most of what they can invest in is brick and mortar, mm -hmm. which is not advantageous to startup founders. Right. And so there's a lot that we can be doing, right? Um, I think from a foundational standpoint, two of the largest foundations that, sub, that fund um, inclusive innovation, I'm not going to say their names, inclusive innovation, and have been funding kind of the support of like black entrepreneurship and ecosystem are actually shifting their focus. So what does that mean? And one of those organizations is one of our largest funders. We've raised about three and a half million dollars over the course of the years to support our work for entrepreneurs. Yeah, yeah, okay. you know. Um, you can look on our website, you, you, and, and they're, she, she they are shift, they're shifting their focus out of that. And I raise that because they have done the work that our local government has not had to do around building a startup ecosystem in South Florida overall, um, and then solely kind of funding right. the black startup ecosystems within Miami. Mm -hmm. And so what's going to happen in 2020 in South Florida that we're still sprouting this thing up? Um, and then our largest funder that supports that work in a way that people are allowed to be experiential with the programs, that's shifting and that's a shifting across the United States. And I would say like the last thing about, I made a list y'all because I wanted to make sure we get this right. 
Um, I talked about procurement, state and local, and then innovation funds. Yep. And so we have backstage, we have cross culture. Mm -hmm. Um, there's uh, like there's a there's um, Detroit like innovation fund like there are and more and more popping and more up more and more yeah. and popping up but not at the rate that right, we need exactly. them to be supporting our entrepreneurs and so as much as we can be funding innovation funds for money specifically around this that is the other thing that we need to be seeing happening and we're seeing it happen but not at the rate that we need our entrepreneurs to be building and having the, the cash on hand to do things. Absolutely. And just another level of encouragement for how we catalyze each other. Everybody in this room can be an investor. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that a lot of people don't particularly understand that, right? There's a really phenomenal group called Pipeline Angels that I was yeah. that I yeah. met last year that introduced me to angel investing and I know all y'all in here go out and you're going to go out in D.C. this weekend and spend money on drinks and do all kinds of stuff. It costs like $5,000 to get trained to become an investor with Pipeline. That's like a Starbucks a day for like right. six months. Mm -hmm. And then you can put that money into other entrepreneurs of color and start to create what, are, what other people like us don't have. Right? It's the generational wealth. It's all these things that are going to extend in the future, um, but I think a lot of people don't even realize that they have the ability to do that and, and, and take that charter on their own, you know? That can is what I, I wanted to one, say. Can I add one? There's not a black version of Pipeline Angels right. that exists. Maybe we that, should make That does the accreditation it. for, like Morehouse had, was trying to do something a few years ago. I don't think it ever got off the ground. I think in partnership with Opportunity Hub, but like that we need mm, to see right. nationally. Right. You know, we have real estate money, we have, gr and then we also have money in our community. So like, Absolutely. let's make sure we have that conversation as well. Like, let's put some grandmas on some panels that have saved money, that have did the early investment and talk about like, what were those conversations that you had at family reunion? What were those planning conversations that you had at Sunday dinner that made it so that you can then understand what your, your grandson, your uncle, what it was, it was pitching in front of you, and then structure those um, those uh, term sheets essentially to make sure that it's something that makes sense for the family. Absolutely. But I don't want to underscore what you said, Felicia, earlier about those two foundations who are moving away from funding. I think it's important to identify all the ways in which we can invest and also all the things I've said previous to this moment about alternative capital formations for our community. But let's be clear, when major foundations decide that they're no longer invested in diversity, inclusion, equity, and entrepreneurship, right? And we have a national government who is not necessarily invested in diversity, inclusion, and equity issues, and you have a huge focus on the Midwest of this country, I think we have to be clear on where we're going. And also think about, in addition to these ways in which we're identifying in our own communities how to, how to generate dollars for our, our businesses. Because for me, having a black business is like a political agenda. It gives you a job, right? It gives your family a job. And the idea that we're heading into a space where foundations who have been responsible for this discussion and government is moving away from this discussion we as black people need to take a, a, a signal from this. And eventually, no offense to Google because y'all are amazing. DNI is an episodic thing, even for tech companies. Mm -hmm. And so I just want us not to lose sight. Yes, I think there are, once again, things we can do and smaller things. But when these larger forces have decided that they no longer want to see or invest in what we are, my solution is this, and y'all know how I feel. It's always a social movement. It eventually comes back to a social movement for black innovation and doing it for ourselves, developing our own capital formation models, um, thinking about data and how that's going to determine our future because computers will not know who we are because all of our data sets are either biased or they're not non-existent. We and need so, a massive product inclusion movement. We need a massive product inclusion community that's driven by black people. Because when those two or three foundations move, that's a sign for other things to come. And I just have to say that to your point. I, I would make the argument that we're at the beginning of that movement. Hmm. Um, I mean, we are, we're at a time where we've got the most uh, black VCs uh, than we've ever had. They're growing faster. Black VCs are, are growing faster in terms of, of the, the population of VCs in general. They're, they're growing disproportionately faster than 
um, white VCs into the market um, in terms of like individual venture capitalists. Right. Um, black people are, even though we're, it, we're still, you know, at the a very small percentage of the overall pie, especially black women, uh, we are seeing an increase in that. Like we've seen folks like the what's what's dude's name that started that uh, sold Shea Moisture. Is doing, Richard, is doing, Richard Richard doing, right, is doing those competitions, right? We got Arlen, we got. Mm -hmm. So I think I think we're at the begin. We're definitely not in the middle of it. We're at the beginning of that movement, and as we see more entrepreneurs come out, exit, do big things. I mean, I, I you know, four years ago, I don't, I don't think I knew one single um, black entrepreneur that had raised over five million dollars. Mm -hmm. Like if we're looking at, let's, let's just look at, let's just use VC as a proxy for mm -hmm. for wealth creation, right? Right. Because they, 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 that's the that's how you get the valuation. Um, I could probably count 20 now, hmm. right? And that's in three years. Um, part of that is, is the increase in my network, but part of that is that folks are raising more money. I mean, even in Minnesota, in Minnesota, we've got <laughs> Minnesota, mm -hmm. Sam can attest to this, you've got, I think, four, four black male founders, male, they're not, no females, not yet, but four black male founders that have raised over $5 million. Hmm. That's just Minnesota. And it doesn't get a lot of national recognition, we don't talk about, but I think, I, wanna, I just want to say, like, you know, where, where it's not, we're at the beginning of that movement. What we need is more people to start participating. We need to educate more people and bring them into the fold and say, hey, this is an opportunity for us. If there was ever an opportunity for us to try to reduce that gap that, that, that continues to widen between um, black wealth and white wealth in, in, the, in, in the United States, this is, this is the time um, where, you, where you, know, you can create technology, um, change the world, and generate a lot of wealth for, for you and your, and your family and your community in a generational way. So I think just getting more people into the fold so we can build momentum um, on that movement, on the social movement, is, is the way to go. I think you bring up a good point about the growth uh, of representation uh, of black folks in VC. Uh, but on the flip side of that, and one thing that is concerning, um, and I think it was TP Insights that released a study on it a, a few weeks ago, don't quote me, someone fact check me, um, that despite that rapid increase of black representation in VC over the last few years, the investment in black run startups, uh, particularly black female startups, has been rel relatively static. So there has not Good. been uh, a, a positive correlation between investing in black businesses in black when more black people are actually making the investments. Uh, and that's something that's really concerning and why I think it is important for us to still look at those alternative funding options outside of the traditional VC uh, model because we're seeing that representation of black folks in making the decision making is not necessarily yielding greater investments in black people. We're going to, um, and that's right. why. Yep. Right. Right. We're going right. to open it up to for questions in just a second. I have one more question. Each of you a short answer on this one. Um, <laughs> I love you. <laughs> I love you too. Um, so we talk a lot about, Felicia brought this up earlier in the panel, but we talk a lot about the challenges that we face. And I think we don't do enough talking about the wins that we've had and the people that are successful, right? We should know the names of all 20 people who have received over $5 million in investment that you know, and we should be using them as a model to move forward. Um, so. In the work that you guys do in each of your local ecosystems and interfacing that you've had with policymakers, yeah. what things have you seen work well? What things do you think could work better? We have policy folks in this room, so this is your opportunity to tell them how they can show up for our community, particularly in the world of entrepreneurship and, and the startup ecosystem. Yeah, I'll go first. I'm talking a lot. Uh, I mean, when it comes to actually like actual public policy, um, I think there's some discussion going on right now at the national, um, in national politics. Um, I mean, around like increasing, you know, uh, funding for uh, startups for small businesses, and, and that's cool. But I don't really see enough discussion at that at the state level. Um, mm -hmm. In Minnesota, I, that's, that's you know that's the best example I have because that's where we're headquartered. Um, we, you know, we've seen things. We have an angel tax credit that that has that, and some of that money is allocated specifically to um, diverse populations. So, if you're a policymaker at the state level, um, really work on like creating those kind of economic vehicles that encourage investing in people of color and under and underrepresented um, founders. And there's tons of ways from a policy perspective to be able to do that. And a great model for that. Um, Minnesota's got a good model. If you want to check out what they're doing with the angel tax credit. Um, Illinois has got a good model. Mm -hmm. um, you can use my software to, okay. to search bills across different... Plug. 
Yeah, just go to uh, inview.io slash demo. E N V I E W dot I O. There you go. Yeah, and uh, holla at me after, and I'll, I'll share the discount code. Um, and uh, but I think there's there's great models that exist right now that that are good models. Let me not say great. Like people are working on them that exist from a policy making perspective. Um, and then just from like kind of looking at, at it from, you know, what can you do individually as a policy person if you don't have the, the power to actually create legislation that can help? Um, I think just spending more t you know, I'm really against, you know, kind of innovation theater where you show up, you have a conversation, you shake hands, you pretend like you care about what's happening in the entrepreneurial community, but it's really just to show face and to go back to your um, to your boss and, you know, say, hey, you know, I spent some time in this community or whatever. Like, that's, like, please don't do that. And I see a lot of that happen within, uh, with, with uh, policy professionals, with staffers. Like, really start to get to know them and spend time with entrepreneurs. Like, have lunch with us. Don't just show up to an entrepreneurial event, to a startup right. event. Like, go out, like, say, hey, you know, you hear somebody talk, speak at a, an event or talking about the problems that we're talking about. Um, dig deeper. You know, go out to lunch with us. You know, have a coffee with us. Like spend time asking about our specific problems. What we talk about right now is pretty general, um, but the, when we really get to, to sit down and have authentic, vulnerable co conversations about the real struggles that we're having as individuals and um, and what they mean in a more broad sense, um, that's when you can really start to understand how how you can you know potentially work with your with your bosses or if you're a policymaker yourself, um, really start looking at how you can create policies, whether whether it be through legis legislative actions um, or through just you know increasing the conversation within committees. So. <laughs> Um, that's my perspective on it. Um, I would just say, hey, get rid of student loans. <laughs> no, 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 seriously. The amount of debt that college, black first generation college students come out with from our universities and our colleges is just unconscionable. Um, and I think it's hard to think about the vision of your idea when you're always having to think about paying back both private Sally Mae, who has interest rates that are just ridiculous, right? And even our staff rent and subsidized and unsubsidized loans. And I know that they're actively having that conversation in the presidential debate, but also many of our Congressional Black Caucus members are having that conversation. And then some type of National Black Tech um, Fellowship. Mm -hmm. Can't, mm, think about it. We have Echo and Green, which is amazing. We have Roddenberry, we have Ashoka, we have Aspen. We have all of these national competitive fellowships that have been created to look at genius across the country, but we not we don't have one that's specifically for black genius in this country. And I think that would be a worthwhile venture for us to think about. So give it a student loan debt, so you have to think about that as you start your business, but then give them capital to envision a better world for our people. That's how we do it. And mm -hmm. also, I have a whole list of, of, of really policy recommendations in here, <laughs> so get at me, but those are my top two. Um, I would echo uh, Demos sentiment that at least on the state level, and I live in the state of New York, um, I've been underwhelmed by the resources that are made available for black entrepreneurs writ large. I have found that uh, the resources that support kind of the black entrepreneurial ecosystem uh, in the state are largely the product of individual efforts or efforts of private entities, right? This is up us lifting us, which is important because ultimately no one's going to save us but us. Um, hey, but um, our state legislators have, legislators have a great room to go in providing actual support to black entrepreneurs and black startups, um, so much so that kind of I knew this question was coming. You're like, what's happening in your state that's really great? And I'm like, eh, not much, right? I, I did not have much positive to share, um, right. tr you know, being frank in that conversation. What I will say, though, is um, from a policy perspective, uh, and even for the individual organizations that are helping to better develop the ecosystem for black founders, um, the areas that we need focus in are, of course, in funding. We've had a whole conversation that is largely revol revolved around capital for our businesses. Um, but oftentimes, we have conversations like these, and we do summits and conferences, uh, and we have a lot of entrepreneurial talks. We have lots of talks about building our startup businesses. Uh, we are always connected to other founders and entrepreneurs. But ultimately, unless we're trying to build a culture and community of solopreneurs, we all have to build businesses with mm. employees with the talent, uh, and I'd like to see greater investment uh, both from the private sector as well as uh, governments in developing talent pipelines for those black founders who want to build companies of talented, gifted 
black talent who are going to build companies um, that shape our future. Right? Plus 100 that, on that point for right. all that, the hiring point is very Right, important. like right. we have so many com conversations about entrepreneurship and I can't throw a rock in my network without hitting another black right. entrepreneur, but there are far fewer black talent uh, mm -hmm. or black tech talent or black te uh, tech adjacent talent for us to hire from right. uh, and fewer communities uh, that are bringing those talent to us as founders. And just one, one more thing, um, read, study, understand the difference between what we define historically as a small business mm -hmm. and then what is an actual like startup mm -hmm. or a right. tech startup. Right. Um, there is a, there are fundamental differences. So yeah. grouping you know, an early stage startup entrepreneur into the small business category um, is not helpful for us. So like just educating yourself as well as to the needs, wants, um, desires of a startup entrepreneur, like tech, true tech startup entrepreneur, um, please like do that work. That's something that you can do on your own just by like going on Wikipedia. So that'd be really helpful for all of us. Yeah, I'd say my two quick things would be um, be more intentional with the benefit agreements that you're putting together. Mm -hmm. um, making sure that they are actually inclusive of high growth opportunities that black companies in your area um, are concentrating on. I am tired of seeing benefit agreements that only talk about construction workers and then mm -hmm. after the project is done, right. like where are the opportunities for start black startup founders um, locally on, and on the state level. And then I would say the other part of that is like we need to be holding the funds that are being put together from a state level more accountable for their diversity efforts. Right, and yeah. so Venture Florida um, exists in, 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 in the state of Florida to fund high tech companies. And the new executive director actually admitted to me last year um, that in the 11 years of its existence and it's being funded by the state that it had never um, funded a black high tech company in the entire state of Florida. That's problematic. Um, and then he also then couldn't show up for Black Tech Week, which is a whole other <laughs> issue. But, but like, that needs to, like, he admitted that and I appreciated him admitting that, right? And then, but why hasn't anyone held that company accountable in the past 11 years? There are high tech companies that are founded by black people in the state of Florida. And they're very viable companies and a lot of them have federal contracts. Like, we can go on and on and so like that has, that shit has to stop, right? Um, and so like those two would be like my, my biggest things is that and then like bring ecosystem builders that exist in your neighborhoods on your committees. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to like, you don't have to go and get a PhD. And technologists, like, and please, technologists. technologists. Yes, like we are here, we are ready. Like when you are Black putting men. committees together, when you're putting task force together, we're not gonna make you feel like an idiot. Like I promise you, we're, we're here to support you. It's okay to come to us and say like, I know this is important. Right. I don't fully understand it. Can you help me understand this so I can be an advocate for you? Mo most politicians in my community don't ever have that conversation with me. I have to come to them and say, listen, I'm not gonna write a blog about you. I'm not gonna tell people <laughs> that you don't know how to code. Like, I yeah, wanna better I understand your world, and I want you right. to better understand my world, so when opportunities come to you, you know how to advocate on behalf of black tech companies, because the, the startups are an accelerated model. They are supposed to go to zero to like 100 within right. the, the And also two all years. of the technology being built by black folks that's going to solve problems that policymakers are trying right. to solve, Absolutely. right? So it's like, how do we connect the two dots? Um, we have a couple of minutes. I would like to open it up for questions. Do we have a mic by any chance? Thank you. Awesome. All right. Hi, my name is Derek Pearson. I'm one of the co-founders of Code Fever along with my wife, Felicia. Um, my quick question is like uh, the context around um, and the segmentation around funding. Hmm. Like, what are your thoughts around how do we create these wealth pockets from the standpoint of using other ethnic groups as examples? So if we look at the Jewish community, without saying a word, they know that they're gonna fund you. If we look at Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, him being funded, he was able to outpace MySpace, Black right. Planet, all right. of these other planets right. because he had that access to capital. If we look at in the Northeast and we're talking about the Catholic uh, group and segment, 
So uh, if, if we look in the Midwest, we're talking about the Mormon group and segment. Right. And then right. if we start looking at Asian communities, they're communal people to begin with. So they don't necessarily have to have that religious organization to keep people morally in check. So how do we create that from a Baptist standpoint, from a Methodist standpoint, mm. from a IFA standpoint, and so on and so forth? Girl, man, you speak in my <laughs> language. Our connectional ministries and our churches are like, ideal spaces and you know and your and, and co-founder wife partner know that it's it's kind of like working with some of our hbcus sometimes um there are some challenges there with translating this new world but i do believe that they are part of the answer um they own the land and they own the people and they also take a tithe and not having conversations with them is problematic the ame connectional ministry church our united methodist contingencies um, Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference, which is probably one of two national economic development Christian faith-based communities that are trying to think through this. But, you know, they don't move quick like us. And you know that because you've had conversations with, with, yeah, right? But I do believe that they are the answer to this. And I think I need more innovators to have a little more patience to go and talk with them in the ways that we have patience and go talk to VCs mm -hmm. about why this is a community imperative for us to figure out how to use all the dollars we collect every week to reinvest into tech startups. But I think our connectional ministries, our churches are the, the answer. So um, I'm, thank you, Felicia. Since it's 11 a.m., I was wondering if we could just do a quick lightning round. You just ask your question and maybe we can close. Yep, and then we can close. Sort of a one minute answer. We're really popular. We don't want to leave. We're going to stay. <laughs> That's fine. Hey, good morning. My name is Marvin Pendarvison. Um, I'm a member of the South Carolina House of Representatives. And Dr. Wilson, this actually is Go a Clemson. question. Go Clemson. <laughs> I'm not going to hold that against you. Um, <laughs> this, this question is for you, and it's kind of a follow-up to this brother's question mm -hmm. right here. Uh, one of the things that we've been wrestling with in our General Assembly is how we can more intentionally invest in, in black startups. And one of the things that you mentioned in regards to the black church and the money that we bring in on a, day, on a weekly basis and how that could be used <clears throat> to go towards our community. <laughs> kind of dive deep more into, from a policy perspective, mm -hmm. what you feel like we could be doing in our general assemblies right. across the country mm. uh, to be more effective in that regard. Okay. Yeah, all popping, okay. Hello, uh, my name is Carlos Mayers. Uh, I'm a young entrepreneur from Hampton University. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, and actually, I did launch my app there just a few weeks ago uh, called Join Me. Thank you. <laughs> um, but my question is, uh, everyone on the board is you know, obviously very successful. And uh, at one point in their life, uh, they you know, worked in a startup or you know, for their own startup. Um, and I'm in the beginning stages of mine. What mm. would you say to uh, an earlier version of yourself uh, when you were beginning at that startup? Uh, what advice would you give yourself? Good morning. I'm Randy Fling. I'm, uh, I run Rolling Out, and I'm also I run Tech Tuesdays with Randy Fling. So my question, as a startup investor myself for the last four years, is if the hundred people in this room, you know, there are crowdfunding funding platforms that you can put in two hundred dollars in. If the hundred people in this room put uh, two hundred dollars into one black company that's 20,000 which is often right. all they need so we do need to stop looking at other places and my suggestion to everyone I hate for y'all to raise your hands those who have and have not including on the panel actually invested in somebody else's uh, startup so the question is please do it <laughs> oh. oh okay I thought we were raising hands <laughs> quick yeah quick question on Arnold King and my question is uh, how does business planning play a role in a tech in a tech business Oh. Mm. Awesome. Oh, um, there's one right here. We're, we're taking a okay, so we gotta, oh. okay, very quickly then. No women. Yeah, no Super women. quick question. My name is Vanessa. I'm with the NAACP. Um, we talked about um, looking for other sources of funding, and um, especially, especially because it's about tech and entrepreneurship. Have you put any thought into looking at the global black community? So specifically the African diaspora and Africans in Africa, because contrary to popular belief, there is actually a lot of wealth in Africa, and there's a lot of room for growth um, with um, technology and startups. Uh, yeah, just last question here, and also we can stay, panelists and everybody can stay after to, to answer these questions as well if you guys would like to have personal conversations. 
I'm concerned about vulture capital, and mm -hmm. that is mm -hmm. wanting 60, 80, 90 percent of a company Ooh. for smaller investments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also about MBC, MBE Edge certifications that require, this is a policy thing, that require people to have made money in order to to uh, to be certified in those particular areas That's that awesome. also keeps black companies out. Interesting. Well, thank you so much for attending this amazing panel. I'm so um, honored to stand up here with you guys and just the wealth of knowledge that you have and that you're doing in our communities to build and catalyze our ecosystems is so honorable. So round of applause for our panelists. Um, Startup.google.com. Uh, check out what we do at Google for Startups. Also, I encourage you all to go on the keyword blog today with Google. We have a black female founder by the name of Courtney Caldwell. She's a founder of Shearshare. Um, she's a friend of mine and wrote a post today about lessons learned in raising millions of dollars. Her and her husband are salon owners turned technologists. A uh, black couple, and their technology is essentially the Uber of barbering and beautying. Um, they can connect. Um, those that do hair and barber to salon chairs that are being unused at other at shops that are open. So a really fantastic company. I, ch I encourage you to check them out. Again, thank you so much for attending, and a huge thanks to um, Congressman and CBCF for hosting this panel for us. Thank you. Thank you. Can we come out so you can see my dress? <laughs> okay, fine. You don't want to get our dresses so we can come up down? Can you? Okay, thank you. Yeah. I was very comfortable with snakes. There's no steps over there. Yes. Okay, okay. Here. Just move the chair and get as much dress as possible. I know, yeah. That's what I'm talking about.